Welcome to the Everyday Mindfulness Show, the -the off-the-cuff exploration of everyday aha moments and life experiences. Join a cast of over 70 uniquely brilliant individuals. Each week, Mike Domish and an eclectic mix of cast members and special guests will engage in mindful and lively conversations about everything from meditation to spirituality to personal passions to successes and failures to relationships to the stuff that makes up the moments of our daily lives. Let's get started with your host, author, speaker, provocateur, and a bit of a goofball, Mike Domish. Yes, hi, I'm your host, Mike Domish, and thrilled to be here with our cast from the Everyday Mindfulness Show. This week's cast includes Rick Clemens and Dr. Jen. Of course, you can check out our brilliant cast and get all the special freebies that many of them have contributed at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. That's everydaymindfulnessshow.com. In this episode, we are discussing love and how do you find it within you? The quote that we're, I'm reading is inspired by the book Breakfast with Buddha by Roland Marullo. You might have heard me quote the book in a few other episodes also. This quote is, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So we should consider asking ourselves that question and consider what it means. Dr. Jen, what does that quote mean to you? I don't personally use words like heaven, having been raised as a Catholic, but I don't identify with that anymore. I identify more as kind of a spiritual atheist. Mm -hmm. However, the idea of the kingdom of heaven within us, of just that idea that we are all, that we're all interconnected, that we all have innate goodness in us, and that we don't have to go seeking outside ourselves for that, that the place to start is within us and that it's already there. I love that you brought up the kingdom of heaven phrase, because in the book, he also brings up that concept of, he really looks at it from all spirituality. So it's interesting that the word heaven is in there, and he's quoting in that part. That part's actually a quote that he used. But then he asked, the author asked, you know, we should question that, we should think about that, because he's following a Buddhist across the country in the book. Right, right, I love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's an interesting perspective. So I, you used a, an interesting word there, which was you're a spiritual atheist. Is that the correct terminology? <laughs> yeah. So could, just for anybody listening, what does that mean? I, well, it's a term I made up when I was, you know, trying to, I, I shifted from identifying, you know, as a Catholic and then just sort of identifying as religious some um, in grad school and then just realizing, no, I actually think I'm an atheist. But I have a lot of spiritual beliefs in the interconnectedness of all humans and that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And then mindfulness and meditation and all of those things were resonating with me. So, I mean, in some ways, my understanding of it, at least the aspects of Buddhism that most resonate with me, is kind of a spiritual atheism, at least compared to how we have at least the mainstream religious beliefs in the United States compared to their view of a God and religion. So spiritual atheism is there's no, I don't believe there's anybody sort of looking down on us making decisions, but I do believe that there's a greater interconnectedness of all of us as humans. I always find that intriguing because many people who come from a place of spirituality versus religion or a combination thereof have this concept that we're all connected, that there's this this universal energy yeah. or this energy of the universe. And it's interesting because people get into arguments about this and it seems to be, it's just who's calling what or what's the paradigm shift they're having. So I know people who say, I don't believe in religion, but I believe there is a force connecting us all together. And I'll say, okay, well, some people call that God. You call it energy of the universe. I'm not saying you personally, Dr. Jem, I'm saying right. others. It, it, so it's interesting because when when people read that quote, the kingdom you know, of heaven is within us. It is interesting how people can view that. Do you view heaven as a religious place or do you right. view heaven as this utopia spirituality that could be within anyone? Rick, what do you think? I kind of concur with Jen. I, as soon as I, and I love that book too. I remember the first time I read that because I come from a somewhat fundamental Christian upbringing myself, which I'm now not practicing because... I'm kind of a spiritual guy. I believe there's like (laughs) lots of different things that connect us all as humans, that there's a greater power of some sort out there. I don't believe I just showed up here, but I know I don't know what's there. And I'm 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 open to exploring whatever shows up. 
And so for me, this whole thing about, you know, heaven is within you is whatever works for you, whatever that heaven means to you and allowing that to be the thing that emanates from within you and not necessarily letting it emanate from somebody else's belief system, which I know puts us in kind of some interesting spaces as time as humans, because everybody's like, okay, but you gotta be like me. Well, what if we don't have to be like you? And what if we don't have to do some of these things we think we have to do? And we just allow that this beautiful space of heaven within being whatever that is that lights you up, which to me is my heaven within is my beautiful soul being that creates my own heaven. That's how I look at it. I love the word of these, your own soul being. And so when you use that phrase soul being, is that, is that your pure, your purest self where your where the world's not influencing, where you're just truly yourself at, at a place of good? What does that mean to you? My soul being is that place that is truly my essence of me allowing me to honestly be myself. And, and I step into that. I try to step into it as much as I can. I know that as a human, one of the things that shows up for me is allowing the judgments or the expectations of others to kind of take me out of that. But when I can hold others' expectations or society's, you know, how we're supposed to show up in the world and go, okay, well, yeah, that works for me. This works for me. And, you know, back to Dr. Jen, you know, Catholicism kind of works, but it fits here in my spirituality. When I bring all that together, my soul being is the essence of what I allow myself to say, this is who I am. I know this is true for me. And I allow myself to embrace that all of this is what makes me me. It's that genuine uniqueness of me that is my soul essence. I think it's beautiful. For anyone listening right now, a great question to ask ourselves is, if you were to write it down, how would you describe your soul being? I love that you've given us that, Rick. And I think it's a great, almost a tool that people can think about to try to help themselves have some exploration. Uh, that they could be beautiful and really think, what is that at its purest place? Because the question of today's show, the, the whole theme of today's show, is love and finding it within us. If we don't know who us is, it's going to be really hard to figure that out about the whole love concept. And I think it goes both ways, because if we don't know who we are, then it's hard to find love within, but then, uh, and vice versa. So yeah. I think maybe they, they you know, they, they kind of go hand in hand of the continual process of pulling back the layers of who do I want to be? Who's, who am I in integrity with my values? Who do I want to be in this world? How do I want to be of service? How do I want to express compassion to myself and compassion to others? And digging at those layers while then we're also pulling back, like, well, you know, what is love? And what gets in the way of self-love? And like, what's that even feel like to really drop into a space of unconditional self-love? Um, and I, so I think, you know, b both of those, they go hand in hand. Absolutely. I, I think when you can hold those hands together of self-love and unconditional love, and, you know, I have a lot because of the work I do working with a lot of people or have done and do some to some degree right now still, you know, people coming out of the closet to be who they are in their sexuality, this self-love is the greatest lesson of also learning what unconditional love is because we so badly as humans, so I'm going to put it in the bigger scope first. I believe we so badly as humans all desire, not need. I don't believe it's a need, but I think we all desire to feel and experience unconditional love. When I take it down to the microcosm of the LGBTQ community, that magnifies so much because we're told we, we, you can't be loved because of who you are, what you are, and da, 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 da. Yeah. And so it starts within. We have to start unconditionally loving ourselves in order to begin to experience what self-love is so that we can also go from self-love and unconditional love simultaneously, whether anybody else wants to give that to us or not. And what I found in my journey was the more I began to really embrace my own self-love, I also learned what unconditional love was because I was giving it to myself. I'm curious, Rick, when you say that, I, I, I feel like what would be a difficult obstacle to overcome a lot of folks is the even starting point to know that they are deserving and worthy of love mm -hmm. in the first place. Yep. 
So I'm like, I'm just curious, like, how do you help folks embrace that even initially? Well, I think the first place we start is, so where, what does love mean to you? Get that yeah. clear. You know, it's kind of, let's, let's break this. Let's not, let's not get to the upper stuff yet. Let's ask, what does love mean to you? And where aren't you experiencing that? Not just in your, you know, coming out process, where in life do you not feel love? And, and when you don't feel love, what does that look like? How does that feel? Because you got to get clear on what not being loved feels like and yeah. what you believe love does feel like. So then we can start to springboard. Okay, so if you now know what love doesn't feel like, it's like the question of what don't you want? We can all kind of say what we don't want, you know, but the hard question is what do you want? Well, what do, what does love really look like for you? And when I ask that question of clients a lot of times, it's really, really hard for them to answer the question because mm. they, they haven't given, they know what love doesn't feel like. But to say, what would love feel like for you? If you didn't have anybody judging it, if you didn't have... You didn't have to worry about what anybody else thought about. You get to choose what love feels like you, for you. What would it look like? And once I can kind of talk them and walk them through that experience, which isn't just like, OK, we do this in one you know, particular mm -hmm. session. It yeah. can take two or three times of really diving in at this. Then we can start to go. So let's talk about if that's what love feels like. And of course, as they're answering it, I'm starting to like, you know, give them some little nudges towards, so what would it be like if you were able to give that kind of love to yourself without saying, so how would it feel to, you know, have self-love? <laughs> and then I keep nudging them toward, okay, so now if that's self-love, then let's take it to another level. What would, you know, what do you think of the term unconditional love? Because that's usually one that kind of screws people up. It's like, oh, it's not possible or, oh, mm -hmm. I think it's this, you know, so it's all a nudging and a stepping and nudging and a stepping with the ultimate goal as, you know, depending on the person, my ultimate goal would be, I really want you to experience self-love so you can experience unconditional love so that in this journey of coming out, you don't have that hinge on your experience of being who you are. If you don't get any of that from anybody else, mm -hmm. you're okay. I love the springboard because I do this in my work on stage, people say, well, I don't know how to talk to my partner about what we want to do in bed. I don't know that they even know what they want to do in bed. And the first question <laughs> I'll say is, well, I guarantee you a question that most people can answer. What do they not want to do in bed? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's amazing how many people, well, I know that. I know, that. okay, well, then start there. <laughs> start there. What do they not want to do? You might get surprised by that answer. They might say, I don't yeah. want to do this one thing that you've been doing for 20 years. But by asking the question, it opens the doorway of, all right, these are all the things that you don't want to do. What are the things you do want to start with? Like, what's just a beginning point? What would you like to try? What would you like to start with? And, and that, what you just described there, Rick, is the same thing with love. Right? What are the things that don't feel right? And what would just be a starting what it would feel? I think a key word there is what if you just had a little bit, right? Just to give them a little, mm -hmm. what would a little bit mm -hmm. feel like? Because I think for some people, the idea of jumping to what does love feel like it seems so grandiose, they can't relate. What would, what would a little love feel like? Like, what would that, what well, would that one do? Of, one of the things that I think helps them, you know, is taking them back to a place where they can remember what love was. And, and you know, no matter, I believe, no matter what experience you've been through, I mean, and I've worked with some clients who've been through some pretty horrific things, but when was that very first time you can re remember experiencing love? Like, you saw a puppy in the window or... You mm -hmm. were on the playground and you, that buddy or friend of yours came up to you and just really smiled at you and said, you know, I'm so glad we're friends. Or that first time you remember hearing your parents actually say, I love you. You know, it's let's get let's go way back to the very first time you knew kind of what love was. And let's just experience that a little bit. I'm not asking you to like grab on to this and hold on to this and let's make this big grandiose thing and let's let's play our own version of the bachelorette you know let's let's take it mm. one little step at a time here because it does become consuming and because so many people that i have worked with have that injury already of you can't be loved because you're lgbtq it takes a lot of small baby steps to get to that place where you can start to really feel the love within. I was thinking, I, I found myself recently, instead of using the word love, I've just been using the word open-hearted a lot more. And just to 
for somebody to understand the difference because I've been really throwing myself into compassion last fall. I took an eight week cultivating compassion class. I just took a little refresher course uh, last night also so with the current political climate. Many of us were finding <laughs> that necessary. And I found that the, the open hearted terminology, just when I talk with folks, I talk about, you know, what is it to move through the world from a place of love, which blows most of our minds. And so then I play with the idea, well, what is it to be open hearted? And even just to sit with, to, to get folks to tap into what that feels like, you know, Rick, you mentioned something about, you know, the first time you saw like a puppy in the window or something like that. And that's actually like pets or animals or something that I use. Cause that's often easy for folks to feel really open hearted, like literally yeah. that e- expansive warmth feeling in their heart. So I say, you know, imagine a pet that you love or imagine, You know, if you have kids, something they did that you felt really proud about. And like, so folks can access that little opening, warmth, heart feeling. And then I go versus imagine somebody kicking that pet, kicking that dog that matters so much to you. And often people feel that restriction, like they close in in their heart. You feel that tightness or you feel that anger. And so that difference of open hearted flowing versus closed. And just for folks to be able to get that, that somatic, that that visceral difference between those and then just start to be able to get the nuances of that. And then, you know, where do you actually start to be able to cultivate choice around that in your interactions with others as you move through the world and how you view yourself? Well, I love, Dr. Jen, how you brought up, you know, what does it feel like when you don't see the right thing? For those listening right now, how do we help and ourselves others recognize when self-love is not present so what what's the warning sign what's the you know the cliche red flag what are things we can look for in our life that says hey i need to take a breath here because i'm not in a place of self-love i'm not in a place of loving unconditionally what are signs that either you rick or dr jen say hey here's what i help people with look for this well i think some of the obvious ones are anger frustration (laughs) just lack of energy I mean, those are like three right off the top that I can go with any client to. Others are going to be like true apathy. You know, you just don't, you don't have any desire for anything. And when I can pick up on those things, or here's another one, lots of energy. Because sometimes if they're demonstrating lots of energy, the thing I will say is, okay, you got lots of energy today. So you're either hyped up on Red Bull or what are you, (laughs) what are you running from that you don't want to like about yourself right now? And it's so interesting when somebody hears that, they're like, damn, how did he know what was going (laughs) on with me, you know? But it's just, I think it's so interesting that we as humans have these like so interesting, like huge swings of what, what we do to avoid some of this stuff. Well, and I love that you used anger because for a lot of people, they might think, well, I don't get angry. And I'd say, all right, what if it wasn't anger? What irritability? I know about (laughs) me when I'm, when I'm snapping, right? And it might not be obnoxiously, you know, cruel or mean or anything, but I just hear that little snap in my attitude in that voice or being short, right? And for a lot of people, they it, what's interesting is a lot of people know not to do that if they're parents. They know not to do that with their kids. So who's left? Their partner. Their partner gets the blunt of those that that energy that is so negative that's not coming from a place of self-love. They'll, and that's not someone you want to be not sharing love with, obviously. And so I think a, a good test is, are you being short with the person that you can most share with in the world? Uh, the, the one that you feel safest with, because that's who you're most likely to do it with. Are you being irritable with them? Uh, do you catch that? Because uh, that, for me, is often the red flag of, oops, something's going on here. I'm, I'm being short for no reason of anything they said. It's something that's going on with me. Yeah, and I absolutely, I was jotting down notes during this, and I was uh, what you guys shared is exactly the type of stuff. I went to anger right away. I went to that, like, how are we distracting ourselves? Um, if you're noticing that you're, you know, numbing yourself or running or hiding more, you know, having more wine at nighttime or zoning out on Facebook or Instagram more or video games or whatever it is like you're you're disconnecting um so you're numbing you're running you're distracting and or if you're lashing out um all of these things that we do when we're not being mindful and not aware of you know the ups and downs of our emotions and when we're you know kind of stuck in our heads too much and and detached from our bodies so I'd say all of those things are things that we do when we're on automatic pilot or when we're stressed or we're just so caught up in our heads 
and not not being grounded in the moment and checking in with the you know everyday joys and everyday appreciations and that are available in every moment. So I mean, it's absolutely a, a mindfulness type thing to check in with ourselves. I mean, and, and I and I think you know whether you're sitting down to meditate and doing formal mindfulness practices or not, at least every day, some sort of reflection back on your day of looking at, okay, you know, was I kind to myself? You know, was the little voice going off in my head and, and, and beating myself up or making me wrong? Where did I feel like I was running, numbing, distracting, or lashing out? And not in a way to beat yourself up for it, but just in a way of reflecting on your day, like, okay, where, where did I feel off today? What do I think I could have done differently? And if I'm in that same situation tomorrow, um, what might I try that's different, that's kinder to myself and maybe more compassionate to others? And Dr. Jen, you bring up the numbing, which Brene Brown talks a lot about also in this idea that, you know, when we're on the Internet, we don't even recognize we're numbing. It's such an addictive response that we don't recognize. And I and I catch myself more and more like asking the question, why am I going on right now? And in a good piece of the time, that answer is boredom, which means I'm numbing, right? I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not, whenever the answer is boredom, you're numbing for any activity you choose just about that is not bringing some form of fulfillment or maybe allowing you to be mindful in the moment. The social media is not being mindful in the moment. That That's not what it's about. That's for sure. I think that's always a good test of why, why am I going online? Why am I having this extra drink tonight? Why am I, whatever it is for the person who's made, like you gave the example, you're having more wine at the end of the night. Why am I making this choice? What's going on here? And I think sometimes it's that we don't know how to quiet the brain. And if we can't quiet the brain, we can't take time to love ourselves. And I know that that's a struggle for me is just quieting the brain enough to allow myself to really have that self-love and that compassion for a busy day, a busy life stress and be compassionate enough to yourself to say it's okay to do nothing you don't need to go online to do something it's okay to mm. do nothing and and that's part of loving yourself and i don't know if i'm right or wrong there what do the two of you think i think you're spot on mike mm -hmm. uh, you know what i as you were saying that one of the first things that ran through my head was it's interesting to me that we can quiet our brain for somebody else but we can't do it for ourselves we will quiet ourselves down and focus on somebody else in our life because, oh, they need me to be here present for them. But the moment we turn that back on ourselves, okay, now I got to get busy again. You know, it's, it's kind of insane that we do that. In fact, I was working with a client yesterday who has literally been in the workforce 28 years, has never had a break, basically went from job to job, literally, you know, not like jumping from job to job, but as one career move would end, he'd go right to the next and right to the next. And so he suddenly finds himself without a job and trying to make the next move. And his partner said to him, why don't you just enjoy this time? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't, he doesn't know how to do that. He doesn't have to go back to work right away. He could actually not work for the next two years and be completely okay, more than okay. And so what we worked through yesterday was what is it going to take for you to really embrace and love yourself enough to just be in this moment and let that be the thing that guides you to your next move. And it came down to, and it was so ironic as we're sitting there, I'm like, I think we're going to talk about this tomorrow on the podcast, <laughs> this whole <laughs> self love thing. Cause he had to open up to that possibility of really loving himself enough to let himself embrace I don't have to be doing anything right now. And it's really okay for me to love myself, to let myself do nothing. I personally went through that the, uh, in the summer of 16, of 2016. I was sitting with my mastermind. And for those who are not listening, mastermind is a group that sort of uh, counsels each other, advises each other in their businesses. And they were all speakers. And it's a small group. It's, you know, five people or so. And we're talking about, hey, I just want to I just want to focus on my unique ability. And one of my mastermind members, who's also a cast member, Lori, Lori Guest, had said, hey, Mike, why don't you just take a vacation from everything except speaking? And at first you're like, well, I can't do that. And he's like, wait a second. You speak 100, 110 days a year. Most people that fly all over the world trying to pull your schedule doing what you do would not be doing anything other than that and recovering mm -hmm. and resting from that. And, and you're trying to do this and this and this. And what if you just said, it's okay that I do all this 
and I don't have to do the other nine things. And what occurred? And at first it was, let's try that for two weeks. Then the goal was six months, but let's just get away with two weeks, Mm -hmm. then three months, and then six months. You know what? Six months came around and we're like, why would I stop doing this? I'm actually getting more done, we're, right? We're able to be in our truly correct space that I should be in and without the chaos of what's next. And that's a great example, Rick, that you gave of it doesn't have to be what's next. It's how about just be present now? Because if you are, you're going to give so much of yourself to the world at a higher level, at a more intense level, because you're not distracted, you're not overwhelmed, and you're in a place of love and purity. So what comes to mind for me is the term restlessness. I was reading a Pema Chodron book last fall. I think it was The Places That Scare You. And I hadn't thought of that term before and how much that comes into play. I think when we're used to being productive or or just I, I'd say how we're trained as a society, that our mind is always going and or sort of our fragmented thoughts and the quick pace with technology, I think that's really cultivated a restlessness in a lot of us. And so when we pause and try to slow down or when people even just try to meditate for five or 10 minutes or when you try to work less or when you try to shut down your brain at nighttime and then, you know, find yourself on social media, I think it's a underlying restlessness in our body. And that's, so that's something I've been playing with since last fall is noticing what does that actually feel like physiologically in my body And what is it to sit with that and stay with the discomfort? Because it is a discomfort to sit with that restlessness and know and and just become intimate with that restlessness and then and and allow that space and just shining that bright light on it. And to me, just giving that that space and acknowledging it and being with that discomfort helps move me through it a lot more quickly. But, you know, Jan, Dr. Jen, here's something else I, I was thinking as you were talking, because there is this restlessness piece. But then there's also this struggle that I think people have, and I think it relates to the restlessness of allowing yourself to be at peace mm. that people struggle with, too, which is the it, which is part of restlessness. It's like, OK, I want to just be focused. I want to be present, you know, and, and because it's like a muscle that we have to train, it's the same thing of, okay, now I'm going to do this, but this restlessness shows up because it, it, you're so used to going, 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 going. Mm -hmm. So you also have the opposite extreme of, okay, now I want to be at peace, but I can't be at peace. So these two things, again, here we are holding hands of what is self loving is to slow down the restlessness and to be at peace. So the two opposites are again, holding hands yet it brings up that energy of how can I do this? Because I haven't allowed myself to love myself enough to know that being at peace and being present is really a condition of self-love and self-care. Absolutely. Yeah. And what a perfect way to bring us around here (laughs) to the discussion. Wrapping up here, what's a book both of you have found was insightful or of great use when really looking at that love and how to find it from within us or that you have found really helps others? You know, I guess one that just kind of, I don't know why it just came to mind. It, it doesn't focus necessarily on it, but um, Oprah's book, I think it's These Things I Know For Sure. There's so many examples she gives in there of how she found ways to be loving of herself so that she could be loving to others. And it's such an easy read. I just, you know, it's not every page isn't going to be about love, but there's lots of little tidbits in there. Yeah. And I'd say I mentioned Pema Chodron already, and I'd say her book, When Things Fall Apart, because that's just like, talk about a paradigm shift about in general, how we're trained to move through the world and even think about love. And it's just like pulling the rug out from under you like, oh, shit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, It's a it's a wake up call and it's a it's rough, but she's so loving. Um, in her writing and so down to earth and honest. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Awesome. So for everyone listening, you can always go back to the website, everydaymindfulnessshow.com. And this will be in the show notes. You can find the book, the author, there'll be a link there. Thank you both Rick and Dr. Jen for joining me today. Absolutely. This was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Absolutely. For everyone listening out there, remember, you can find out about Dr. Jen and Rick Clemens On our website, you can learn about all of our cast, our brilliant cast members at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. Until next time, may you enjoy everyday mindfulness in your life. 
three quick reminders. One, please subscribe to the Everyday Mindfulness Show on iTunes. Already subscribed? Then encourage others to join us by inviting them to subscribe to the show. Two, while on iTunes, download all the latest episodes. Three, reviews help more people find out about the show. Would you please go into iTunes and write a review? Doing so helps spread the mission of the show. Thanks. We appreciate you being a part of our vibrant, oftentimes silly, and always vulnerable community. If you have an idea, a thought, want to sponsor the show, or just want to say hi, send us an email at listen at everydaymindfulnessshow.com and check us out at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. Have a joyful, mindful week.